this episode we'll talk to Angela and Josh from Booz Allen Hamilton machine learning experts about their latest book The Mathematical Corporation so stay tuned Welcome everyone to another episode of Future of Data podcast. Today we have wonderful two wonderful guests and I have been fan of both of them uh, I think in st- starting 2015 when they uh, they happily joined one of our event in back in uh, in Boston and I've been following the, following them and recently I saw Angela and Josh from Booz Allen they published their book. I quickly jumped and say hey we need to have you guys on 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 our on uh, on our podcast talking to our audience. and they took the bait they they jumped in and again amazing people do amazing things so that's uh, one one example in action so um, to give you a very quick sneak bite uh, J- joshua and and um, and angela they both are uh, machine learning and big data experts in booz allen hamilton and currently author of uh, the mathematical corporation so i would let uh, josh and, and angela talk about um, their background and and introduce to our audience and and again thank you thank you so much angela and josh for for jumping in so quickly and such a short notice and love to have you on board great hey michelle hey everyone and thank you to you michelle for everything that you do for the community all the events and activities it's really great to see. see all of uh, the things you're doing. Awesome. So, I'm Angela Chavern. I'm a vice president at Booz Allen Hamilton, and I specialize in machine intelligence and how it relates to leadership and strategy. And thanks for having us. Um I agree. Thanks for all that you do for the community. It's a vibrant community. I'm Josh Sullivan. I'm a senior vice president at Booz Allen, and I lead our data and advanced analytics work. and i have the kind of immense pleasure of working with hundreds of people way smarter than me doing some uh some incredible work with clients all around the world awesome um again glad to have you guys on board and i'm super excited to just jump on 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 the topic of the day your book so let's let's talk about um mathematical corporation what is this book what like if you can give us some background So we were out there working with hundreds of organizations and these were government organizations, commercial organizations, nonprofits, and we saw a theme emerging that these leaders in the organizations were trying to figure out how to use machine intelligence, but the hardest part wasn't just about the technology. Some of the hardest questions they were struggling with involved strategy and culture and leadership. And so Josh and I really wanted to compile all of these amazing stories of these leaders in the book. We have 60 leaders who are profiled in the book and over 100 different organizations and they were really excited to tell their stories and share their experiences with everyone else. You know, it's kind of refreshing to hear a lot of the leaders talk about um all the hyperbole and all the hype in around these technologies and how some of them cut through it and um had some really tremendous successes uh with their pilots and how others you know maybe took the long journey and uh and you know did some pilots and really had to learn their way along to how to how to make sense of all this technology and how to actually um ignore some of the hype and make it real inside their organizations right no i think that's that's fabulous and and um even even in 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 our journey sort of i think one of our early friends were you guys and 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 um, other consulting firms and i think it's always fascinating to see how much of exposure you guys have because of because of your you have a lot of clientele and across various verticals sharing your thoughts and 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 sharing with us uh, through this book and and similar template i think i'm i'm i'm, I'm again kudos to you guys for jumping the the ship so what motivated you to to uh, to write this book what's what's the what's the like what is that nirvana point when you said okay we have enough now let's let's talk about it in in this arduous way or something so if you can shed yeah. some light you know angela i think said it well when she talked about we were talking to so many of our clients and we're seeing so many of the same patterns happening over time and for me what was apparent was that we were in the thick of data science we had written the field guide to data science a few years yeah. ago we were really out there with the rubber meets the road 
And we started seeing clients who were taking the same trade craft they use in data science, the same kind of workflow, but having machines start to automate pieces of that. And actually saying, can um, an AI engine, you know, some, some form of collection of um, machine learning algorithms actually suggest models and features. And they were trying to get on the road so that machines were actually doing the data science trade craft in combination with humans, never to replace them, but actually in combination, like how do you have a really smart person and get some scale out of machines doing data science? And so the idea of like, how can machines do data science was, was really interesting to us. And so we spent um, years with clients, the last few years, really helping them through the journeys and being there with them. And um, so that was, that was really was powerful for me is like, if we can get into that space and, uh, and help people understand, um, you know, it could be revolutionary. And then Angela, of course, with a background in leadership and, and understanding culture, really brought all those other dimensions um, that make this real for every organization. And, and so it just, it all came together for us, I think, in a, yeah. an interesting book. Yeah, totally agree with Josh. And the other thing that really motivated me was that clients were having to go through this on their own and figure things out for the first time. And rather than having people continue to figure it out on their own, um, there's a real benefit from learning from other people's stories. So that was another big motivating factor is to just help everyone kind of embrace these concepts. And they don't have to start from scratch every time. They can start where others have left off. Interesting. And so how much time it, it took you to sort of uh, gather all the content um, and, and put it into a book and convert it? Like, what's the, what's, what's, what's the time span, if you can share with us? Well, I think the content creation was probably a 14-month process just of collecting and curating um, real stories from, you know, these over 160 organizations. Um, and then the overall process is closer to probably 18 months. Um, just wow. Wow. Editing those kind of things. But some of the projects have gone on even before that. I mean, this is a journey that Josh and I have been on for the last five years in terms of the work mm. that we do. And so, really, these, these projects um, are from some of those early days as well. I think, uh, and, and, and thank you, Angela, for sharing that because I think even uh, whenever I, I talk to uh, people from consulting background. I think this is that the fascinating thing that these guys have treasure trove of information from their clientele who like they have been dealing with real cultural issues that businesses are having. They're dealing with a lot of sort of uh, these merging the technological gap and 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 this cultural sort of uh, preservance and and connecting these two together. So again, I, I I want to emphasize again to our audience that it's important to sort of get insights from folks who are actually dealing with a lot of this diverse background and organization and i think you guys i think again kudos to you for bringing your leadership and and sort of thinking into that book i think that that's that's pretty awesome so let's let's talk about machine intelligence i think i i've i've, I've heard a couple of times that that um that amazing keyword um it's it's slightly twist from what we typically hear either it's ai or machine machine learning so if you can shed some light of what is machine intelligence and also let's let's talk about what is it uh so what will happen to the intuitive intelligence that pretty much human provides? Like what's, what, do you have any, any, any perception or any sort of thought behind that? You know, I think of uh, machine intelligence, I often say to my, um, you know, there are a lot of buzzwords and a lot of probably interpretations. My own view of machine intelligence is that at some point we will have machines that can perceive and understand the world around them to some degree that can reason to take action and, and reason in order to take that action um, through a decision-making process. And they can do that independently you know, without a human. And I think we're going to see very early signs of that. I think we're seeing it now. And it's only, you know, just like the advent of the internet and the, and the steam engine and integrated circuit, it's going to drive a change in how we live and work. And we'll start to see that slowly over time. It's not going to happen overnight. I think we're starting to see this emergence of machine intelligence um, happening in all kinds of industries. That's how I think about it. And we think about machine intelligence as kind of having two main pieces. There's high performance computing and all the chips you need to run the math that's required. And then there's artificial intelligence. And as you know, machine learning is kind of a piece of artificial intelligence that has experienced the most breakthroughs recently. And um, 
Josh mentioned MI, I would highly encourage everybody on Twitter, let's start using hashtag MI because it's really long to spell out machine (laughs) intelligence all the time. (laughs) I agree. That's amazing. Yes, yes. So now let's let's talk about mathematical cooperation. What the hell is that? Like, if you can if you can shed some light, what what is mathematical organization? You know, I I think of it as an idea. It is an a goal, an end state. Um, if you think of all the dimensions of being a good leader, all the dimensions of using this technology, uh, both people and machines, and the idea of you're going to have a software coworker, you know, in the very near future, probably. And how, as a leader, does that even work? And, and um, how do you use this technology in a meaningful way? So for me, a mathematical corporation is one that embraces all the ideas of the dimensions of leadership that we outline in the book, the practical use of the technology in order to think and work differently, like in a new competitive environment. So I think mm-hmm. it's the, the, the business model of the future. Yeah. agree with that. Yeah, I, I think it's a completely new operating concept for organizations. We can't continue to run companies the same way we have for the last 100 years. It doesn't work in a machine intelligence enabled world. And so everything Josh talked about, the culture is different, the strategy, the leadership required is different. And one thing that we found in the book is that you absolutely have to have an experimentation type culture in order to succeed with machine intelligence. Most companies don't don't really have that or they're just starting along that journey. So that's a big shift for many organizations. I agree. I mean, can you imagine running uh, a company today without the internet? Like how would your company be like if you weren't internet enabled or what the right word is? Can you imagine? Uh, the future is going to be the same with, with MI. I mean, it's going to be hard to imagine how this doesn't affect every, every business out there um, over time. And if you look at most company strategies today, those strategies do not include machine intelligence as an enabler or as a competitive threat from non-traditional competitors or new entrants to the market. Interesting. Yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. And so um, I have have a segue thought in that. So I think... um, we hear a lot from a lot of businesses that hey data science and being data driven it's still it's still a play for lords and kings like it's still not uh, level to the commodity of a small business or mid mid businesses so what what is your take on who would embrace this idea of mathematical organization like what's the ideal fit for a business if i'm a business that i should think about this uh, do you have any any thought on that yeah so i love i love that you asked that question and in fact some of the examples in the book are very small companies and startups. So Josh and I have seen how this applies to really organizations of any size. And one advantage that some of the smaller companies have is that they could actually leverage some early technology investments that maybe large companies are making and then releasing open source. And so we think about it as applicable to organizations of any size. And back to Josh's point about the internet, could you imagine any size organization today that wouldn't use the internet? Of course not. So that will be the same with machine intelligence in the future. Yeah, there's a great example in the book from a small company in Boston called Epidemico that used a lot of these technologies to kind of rethink um, their, their business model, rethink how they engage in their community. And they actually imagine a future where they partnered with Uber to deliver flu vaccines to people who needed them um, by using Uber as kind of a distribution network. And their entire focus of their business was um, understanding disease and the spread of disease and using social media and other forms to kind of track and, and, and really understand the spread of disease. And so it was really interesting that they were able to take these kind of um, concepts and these kind of technologies around machine learning. And instead of hiring a bunch of data scientists to do it, they try to use it to reimagine part of their business model. And you know, that to me is a great example of what's possible this kind of technology. And what, what's possible when you have the right leaders trying to imagine what they can do with this technology. I think that's 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 definitely exciting. Um, what one thought that I, I'm sure you must be hearing like uh, like uh, with with exponential than what we hear from our from our lens. Many of the businesses, so we hear a lot that hey, culture, like we are culture, culture is very close to us, and in in many ways that's a detractor for any change, right? 
let we have to just we know the way we are doing this our, this is our secret sauce let's not change it and then we have this rapidly emerging world which is fueled by all of this, this sort of these uh, um, technology companies and what's happening so what are some of the hacks so if i'm if i'm part of say that organization which is very heavy on culture and say hey no it's it's again it's it's data too much like openness and all that and and putting our sort of all the eggs in something that we which is very predictable what is what is your pitch to those executives who are stuck in that that cultural sort of uh, paradigm who want to change but but again they are just pretty much slaves of their culture and that it's very difficult for them to move on uh, if i if i may use that word so what what are, what are you thinking on that yeah so one of the biggest uh, success factors that we found across all of the leaders in our book is the ability to shatter their own constraints. Hmm. So we all have constraints. They're built in based on our life experiences. And we all have those um, ideas about what's possible and what's not possible. Um, one example that demonstrates this is NASA. Hmm. There's a group at NASA working on building an artificially intelligent robot doctor to treat people living on Mars. Now, if you don't, even believe that living on Mars is possible in the first place, you're certainly not going to devote your career to building an AI doctor or a doc in the box, as they call it, you know, to treat people living there. So that's a leader's job. And that involves shattering your beliefs about, you know, what you can and can't do, because many more things are possible today than in the past. And then rallying people behind that vision and enabling them to make technological breakthroughs. I think shattering constraints is certainly one major culture factor. Well, and, you know, I think my bumper sticker version would be uh, your competitors maybe are not waiting to try this out. So <laughs> you, better, you better find your wherewithal to start an experiment or a pilot and start trying. Another huge shift for leaders has been moving away from reliance purely on gut instinct and mental models and coming to rely on the machine as a true collaborator, not just as a tool carrying out instructions. Josh and I like to say uh, machine intelligence is really another seat at the table in your boardroom. Hmm. I think that's, that's well said. Um, sorry. Yes, Josh. Yeah, I was going to say some of the best examples that you can read about in the book in great detail. Um, they, they have leaders who understand the, the real beauty and complexity of the world. Like the world is complex. Most of our models are very simple and they don't create, they don't reflect the complexity and beauty of the real world. And uh, some of the best thinkers have figured out ways to better approximate um, their models, better use this technology to try to reflect the real complexity of their business and to help them make better decisions. So, so it can start to be a combination of gut, gut instinct, and your own experiences plus kind of what is the machine telling you and over time figure out how you start to incorporate more of that into your decision making. So. Interesting. There's yes. There's another example in the book about Merck and they had a lot of data uh, in their manufacturing process. And so there's a story about um, their vaccine manufacturing process, which is a four stage process. And they had a ton of data and were optimizing each of the four stages individually. And it wasn't until they really looked across the entire process that they really made the breakthrough that they were looking for. And some of the um, culprits that they thought would be causing the problems, like raw materials, turned out to be not a problem. And it did turn out to be some of the uh, elements of the fermentation process. So it was really unexpected result when they looked across a spectrum of models and not just optimizing each individually. Right. No, I think that's that's well said. And and, and I like I think many times that we should have something like a lean in model. Pretty much, we just like to to get businesses more flex about this idea of hey, data driven because it's a cultural shift. Like I talked to a lot of business. Like I, one of the guy actually he put it. He's one of the skeptic and 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 and, and definitely executive of, of a big company. And his point was that, uh, hey, I don't want my core competency to be wiped out or shared with everyone with the next software upgrade. That we hear a lot from sort of bunch of skeptics, hey, that if I'm relying too much of my thinking process on these machines and capabilities, then we may not know what we are, what we'll lose 
or 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 the other side is we may not know what what probably we could gain so what are some of your thoughts on 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 to that skeptic you know we have a lot of conversations with both clients and then just people we know and leaders and and that's a resiliency conversation it's a risk and resiliency and i don't believe in the big bang theory of analytics right where you're going to turn your organization into data driven or whatever bumper sticker you know hype um term you want to put in front of it it is a long deliberate process that is evolutionary over time that is um, resilient to your business model and adaptive and if you don't set out in that way and start with a culture of experimentation with accepting failure as the condition of learning and um, start yourself in that in that thinking um, you're never I, I don't believe going to get to a true data driven organization you're never going to be a mathematical corporation and, and some of the ideas that we lay out in the book. You know, instead, you're going to optimize at point solutions. When you optimize locally, you, you never get to optimize globally, right? And so mm. um, there's this big point. trade space there, and leaders have to understand that trade space. There's an example of this in the book. So ideally, you want to bring everybody along, and everybody buys into it, and everybody changes the mindset and comes along on the journey. In reality, that doesn't always happen. So there's an example in the book of the U.S. Army. Kevin Coggins is a um, civilian senior executive, and his role was to lead all of their position navigation and timing, or what they call P&T. And P&T is absolutely critical to everything they do. So soldiers, weapon systems, you know, ships, aircraft, you name it. And when Kevin came in, they had 212 different GPS systems. Um, on one aircraft alone, they had 14 different GPS inputs. And so he wanted to actually connect all of those GPS signals, plus do additional machine intelligence to account for times when GPS was either blocked or spoofed or down, uh, unavailable for some other reason. Kevin found that Technology wasn't the roadblock, it was really people, leaders, and he, in the end, he did have to replace, you know, several of his key leadership team members in order to bring in people who were willing to go along that machine intelligence experimentation journey, and in the end, it worked out really well for them, and they've done something that um, hasn't been done before and the soldier doesn't even realize when the machine intelligence is kicking in and when it's the GPS. Interesting. No, I think that's definitely um, uh, well said. So I think one thing we, we, we again, we uh, get into this conversations a lot um, talking about, so there are two bands to this entry. So one is, okay, what's the start of when, you're called, when, you, when you can comfortably say I'm data driven and where does it end, right? So definitely it's, you cannot be 100% data driven. And that's that's the whole point of, there's an intuition and intuitions rank very highly when it comes to mathematical models. So what are some of your thinkings on uh, what what are those sort of entry and the, and the exit barriers that businesses should think about when they think about, hey, wh what is what is too much data driven or what is too less data driven? Like, do you have any perception or any thoughts on that? You know, that, that great question. I don't know about the exit I've never maybe seen anyone that, that mature yet. So I think it's kind of teaching. None of us have. Yeah, a lot of entry barriers. We've seen a lot of people want to, to try to take the special knowledge inside their great people and like code that into a model. And maybe less to, it's less about maybe eliminating that, that job. But, you know, they think they're, the first way they should be data driven is take all the context that's in someone's head and get that into a model. And I think that is a really huge barrier to start and probably not the right way. And I think a lot of people think about, oh, I've got you know, this great function somewhere in my organization. I'm going to start by taking what's in their head and trying to get it into a model. Probably um, not the best place to start. Most people already have a lot of analytics running to better understand what has already happened. Uh, generally, I think the next um, barrier to cross is to start having a decision-making process that has some amount of predictive analytics into it and actually get very comfortable um, in order scoring your decisions against the predictive models and, and evaluating them over time and getting very comfortable in doing that. And, and not only then can you really start having humans and machines starting to collaborate. And that's kind of the next big step on your way to, uh, to using machine intelligence, right, and being a mathematical corporation. You want 
machines and humans collaborating. You want a machine as a collaborator. And I think that's kind of the next big barrier, the next big wave um, to get over. And I, uh, you know, in the book, we talk about a number of organizations, both big and small, who are starting that process. Yeah, I totally agree with Josh. I think another barrier is actually strategy. So take hmm. Google and Tesla, um, their automated vehicle businesses, obviously both very data-driven, technology-driven companies. The way Google went about collecting data was they used kind of their vehicles and their employees um, who would drive around and they would collect the data. And it took them about six years to gather a million miles worth of driver data. Tesla, on the other hand, put self-driving features in every car they sell, and they collect a million miles of driver data every 10 hours. So, you know, same technology, same business, but two very different strategies. And another twist is the um, search engine, Chinese uh, search engine firm Baidu, mm. they announced they're actually going to release their self-driving software open source. So yet another different strategy move. So how this will play out remains to be seen, and the you know the, the people who leave will probably end up being a combination of all those approaches. But strategy can be a real advantage and also a real barrier. Right. No, I think that's a good. And, and, and you're raising a very interesting point. And, and definitely, I would I would take a segue into that uh, at least for for a bunch of questions. So you talk about um, open source, right? I think that's another hurdle. You guys must be hearing a lot that hey. Enterprises locked down, secure. Like I know what what I what pretty much someone is thinking and making sure that the business enterprise and sort of my sense is not being impacted. But now when we talk about open source and there's a massive community push from the open source side that even the current the people that you are hiring nowadays even they are demanding that your your organization should be more adaptable to sort of these open source capabilities. Now uh, isn't that uh, sort of uh, releasing your some of the core competency to this open source platform or capabilities that you have less control over. Now we're talking about sort of now mathematical model is all about being more predictable. But now how can we be more predictable when we're using very unpredictable environments? So do you have any any take on that? Yeah, my, my sense just from hundreds and hundreds of different clients is that it's a that's a really complex ecosystem. Everyone has their own, I think, varied approach to that. I'm not sure there's a one, you know, size fits all or even one theme um, of an answer that I've seen. Even large organizations will sometimes embrace an open source culture in one division and not in another. It's a it's a risk tolerance. Um, I will tell you. I have noticed some of the conversation lately moving away from closed source, open source to more um, long-term vendor lock-in in terms of a platform. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if I'm going to be on one platform, how do I make sure I'm not locked into that long-term? And that's been more the nature of the conversation. And I think that's why you're seeing the rise to um, even a lot of the analytics that we create clients and, and some of the strategy, um, they're wrapped in containerization, you know, their containers wrapped around. Um, microservices that are interact with some of the some of the uh, analytic endpoints as inputs and, and part of the flow. So, um, so I, I you know I think I think we're turning the corner. I think on to some degree on open source versus closed, and that's more of a, a business model conversation versus if, if if as a leader I'd be more worried about lock in and, and the risk and cost if I wanted to move a platform. In addition to open source, we're seeing a big trend toward open data. Uh, so mm -hmm. not only open government data, but also uh, social good uh, efforts involving open data. And so we have the Kaggle community and the data science bowl challenges where the data science community has made huge breakthroughs in terms of predicting lung, can lung cancer, um, heart health, ocean health. And we've seen companies like GlaxoSmithKline actually release formerly proprietary data, medical data, mm. and um, that allows the community to make new medical breakthroughs for the for kind of the greater social good. So um, open data is hugely important to the community. I think just about every data scientist at some point trains on uh, Census Bureau data or you know some other. Kind of government data so we need to continue to support 
that and to continue to advocate for open data, both from the government and private entities as well. I think that's, yeah. that's well, well said. Yes, yeah, sorry. The GSK example, um, I won't give it away. You got to read the book to uh, to get. But it is an it is an amazing example of how giving away data can actually give create more value for you in the end. Hmm. Really interesting. Well, I think well said. So now, uh, in context to your mathematical organization framework, so how would how would that respond to something like open source and closed, and and how would that respond to as you're saying vendor lock vendor locking? Like, do you care if 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 you're on on this journey of being a mathematical organization? Are these some of the some of the some of the KPIs that that you worry about? Like, what do you think about this idea of how much I should be open source, how much I should be, or like, what are your th thoughts on that? Just for, I think from being in the in the trenches and so many different um, industry verticals that that we move within, that at least in the in terms of the book, it, it's not something we spent a lot of time kind of um, diving into because it's such a complex ecosystem and it's mm -hmm. such a domain specific and industry specific kind of decision framework that you know that's one of the areas where there's there's not one rubric by, by you know that you can set out a set of recommendations it's just the topology of that space is just way too complex really interesting so um let's let's talk about um um so in in mathematical organization so i'm a small business i want to, i want to get started like what are some of the some of the initial uh, steps or thoughts or, or good strategies that you would suggest for us to sort of execute. And so if you, if you want to get the journey, some thoughts. So I'd say the first thing for small businesses and for leaders, first, depending on how much they know about machine intelligence, it really helps to educate yourself about all the examples out there, who's doing what and what's going on, because learning about that can kind of spur your own ideas. Um, then I would think about the actual products or services you sell and how those can be enhanced by machine intelligence. And then finally, I would think about your own internal operations. Do you need uh, somebody scheduling your appointments or can that be done by a machine intelligence uh, enabled assistant? So I think all of those pieces fit into a small business strategy. That's so true. I, I, I totally agree. We've talked to a few small businesses where the the owner was thinking that this kind of technology would replace someone's job. They're thinking of it as a job replacement mm -hmm. instead of technology. And I think there's a lot of danger in that. I'm, um, Angela and I actually disagree on, on a topic here that we can share with you. But I, I, I think right now the state of the art is machine intelligence can help you automate certain activities that you do. Hopefully it's the toil, you know, the mundane yeah. stuff, the repetitive stuff of a knowledge worker. That would be the place, I, if a small business, I would look, look to create value from machine intelligence. Um, it's not a job replacement program, and I've been surprised at how much I've heard that and how many questions you know, we've, we've gotten around that. <laughs> now, Angela and I disagree. I actually think long-term now, if you think long-term, I think there will be job replacements. I think we will have job loss, net job mm. loss because of this technology. Um, long-term, I don't think that's around the corner, mm. but long-term, I do think that that will actually um, absolutely happen, but we disagree on this. Topic. And it's a friendly disagreement with your co-author. It makes the book discussions more interesting. So, um, my point of view is, I believe long term that machine intelligence will be a net job creator. And mm -hmm. the reason I believe that, I, I agree with Josh in that um, there will be many um, jobs that exist today that machine intelligence will automate and replace. But I believe that it will create businesses and launch entirely new industries and that will result in a net increase of overall jobs i think it's right now you're hitting something which is very close to even even my heart so uh, i i'll give the third perspective when we're talking about this i think so uh, like so i we recently worked on an ai tool called tau and the our sort of uh, futurism imagination is that it's vishal and vishal's ai that would be counted as an entity so that it's 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 job of my AI to tell me what I should do, to 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 stay gainfully employed or whatever, right? So that is because I think there has been a lot of talks around whether AI will take away jobs, but there is not much conversation around can AI help save it, right? Can because AI knows where intuition is better modeler than sort of um, a, a, a raw mathematical sort of 
uh, non perceptive analytics right so from that pers- perception uh, this is that's why i think um, uh, spot on that uh, it it will be somewhere in the middle it, it's ex- exciting time for all of us by the way so yeah. for sure your uh, your ai collaborator that's right right ex- 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 exactly it it will be your biggest biggest friend so um, i think before we have job loss well i think we'll get there and then i think yeah. after that we'll face the job loss it, yeah i think every every time it it happened for for almost like every, if you look at you look at past and this is another thing i i i i i i suggest almost all the executives find a similar story either in nature or in the past like you the moment you find a story you know what to expect because many time you know so one of the best example as I, I was talking to one of the one of the healthcare executive and he was talking hey look at look at the war scenarios because like there's a war going on and and and, and f- so he end up sort of picking one of the one of sort of old chinese uh, uh, war scenario and he said hey this is what resonates and exactly this is this is how the world be here because we as long as humans our intuitions are involved we are very predictable in from our intuitive point of view so sorry for the segue i just I really- again I, example um, is auto trucking and mm. so that was a company created by Google engineers um, within 10 months bought by Uber for 680 million and so they actually made their first automated delivery last year uh, mm. in Kansas auto, yeah. year uh, but for right now the driver is still riding in the cab because the driver has to take over in bad weather or in city streets but on the highways a driver is freed up to do whatever he or she wants to do and there was a great story about a driver who was in the back of the cab doing yoga uh while the <laughs> intelligence was driving i think that's that's fabulous so um uh, i think so regarding this new emerging companies right they have they can pretty much work on the latest i think they are at at advantage where they have not yet fixed on the culture of the company so they can be data driven they can be whatever and i think that's why you are rightly right in saying when that startup has the maximum leverage in this they can be whatever they want to be and they don't have they don't have an inertia problem that most of the big businesses have that they have to they have to curtail so do you have any any sort of any shortcut or thoughts of uh, if if i am say a, again a very gut based organization and we're talking about mathematical organization now what are some of the key things i should do uh, to to sort of translate into that uh, data driven zone yeah you know, many of the stories in the book of uh, large companies pharmaceutical companies energy companies banks uh, even government organizations almost to a t i would say every one of them had an ingrained culture they did things a certain way folklore and the kind of the, we've always done it this way um was was resident in all their decision making and every one of them that was successful essentially had a startup with inside their organization to try to use these technologies that had some level usually CEO or direct you know the um agency head or CEO level endorsement and it took 18 months and um they had to kind of prove their, their worth and only only when they moved past that barrier could they start to think about how to affect the rest of the culture over time And by the way, we've had some great leaders that we worked with. I think one of the quotes we hear all the time is it only takes 20%. You know, once you can get 20% of the leadership team convinced, you know, the that's snowball is starting to roll down the hill and that's all you need. And I I I agree with that. I've seen it in practice. Um one of the big uh departments that will be impacted by this clearly will be all IT departments um mm. in any in organization. And so Josh and I say imagine a world where there are no IT departments and it sounds kind of far fetched but mm. it's actually close to reality than we think because the amount of resources and time and um labor that companies spend on IT O&M you know a big chunk of that can be taken over by machine intelligence so companies have to start thinking now about what to do with all of that talent and how to re train them revector them refocus them on more creative type activities interesting so uh, now i think let's let's get back to our book a bit so when you are writing this book you have a perception of what what an ideal organization is right this is what i this is what we call a qualified um uh, organization that just that those are those, those have made it so do you have any uh, like a definition or sort of a, a picture perfect 
image of who is the ideal hero in this book? Yeah, so we say in the book, there is no fully mature mathematical corporation yet. Um, there are certainly companies that are close and uh, companies like Google, you know, uh, going AI first and, and other companies as well. But um, the mathematical corporation is really a vision for the future based on many examples that we're seeing today. And so no one's quite there yet, but the major components of it are impossible strategies, meaning the leaders are willing to shatter their constraints about what's possible and go after something totally new. What we call impossible technology. And the reason we call it impossible because it just didn't exist or didn't work a few years ago um, like it does today. And then really kind of that leadership, uh, big mind component of the equation where a, from the top down, leaders are encouraging the entire organization to experiment, to think differently, and to really make big breakthroughs. Interesting. So now, now let's talk about, um, so I don't know if I, it's, it's, it's a, one of the useless questions, but I, I'll, I'll ask regardless. So what are some of the businesses who are not right fit for this? Do, I, do have. I don't think there are any that are not a right fit to this. I mean, I go back to Josh's point about the internet. I mean, is there a company you can think of today that's not a good fit for using the internet? So, I mean, I'd, I'd say it, you know, the, the business that wants to go um, out of business, yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but listen, this, there's a lot, a lot of these technologies have been around a long time. And there's a lot of hype mm. around this and you know, we'll go through the trough of disillusion and we'll go through a time when there's an industrial level AI accident. Mark mm -hmm. my words, you know, that, that something like that's going to happen and it's going to cause a lot of pause and people will recoil a little bit. Um, people will be afraid of losing their job, even maybe that may not be the case in the near term. Um, and it may never be the case for, for a lot of people. Um, all that will kind of be in the atmosphere. And so I think people, there'll be a lot of turbulence around using this technology, but if, if leaders, we don't kind of cut through that and understand what it is and what it can really do right now and what the long-term potential is, we don't start figuring that out now, you know, you're going to be racing and, and losing a competitive advantage to, uh, you know, a competitor who's already started to think about this. So like now's the time to start thinking about it. And I think it's got to be every organization and how much you put your toe in the water could be different for each organization. But, um, you know, I think Andrew's point about the internet is great. I mean, you would never start a company and not have email or use the internet. And the same, same is going to be true. No, it's, it's funny, actually. So I, 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 I uh, sort of, uh, uh, it reminds me of a conversation I have with one of the chief risk officers of, of one of the banks. And he put it the best. He said that, um, Michelle, you know the problem with the industry today is that a bank cannot be a software, but a software can be a bank. So it's, it's my job to be like, get there faster than those guys get to us in some ways. So I think that his panic was very clear from this. So he said, this is my, my sales pitch to my executive all the time that sure, like we can just be relying on the regulation for quite some time till we exist. But the moment that those regulations are off, then we are toast. So I think that's, um, you rightly said that if you're not, if you're not in it, then there's a strong chance that probably you lose this, you lose this train very soon. Well, I mean, you, you have to look back just on, as humans, how we live, right? The, mm. the invention of the continuous motion steam engine changed the very nature of how we live. The invention of the integrated circuit changed the nature of how we live. The invention of the internet changed the very nature of how we live, right? And so you see these and, and ever increasing in speed coming more and more frequently. And each one of those had business repercussions as well. And so, you know, this is just the next of another line of these. And... You know, if you're asleep at the wheel um, and not paying attention, your business will suffer. I mean, it's just that simple. That's interesting. Talking about sleeping on the wheel, so... Uh, yeah, don't do that, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, uh, to our audience, don't do that. It's not, uh, so, talking about that, which industries are you seeing leading, uh, leading or lagging this adoption curve of being the mathematical organization? Do you have any perception or uh, any thoughts on that? Sure. So clearly, um, anyone in the automated vehicles space, you know, they're they're really leading. They're making huge investments. Um, a lot of the retailers um, are 
early and using behavioral analytics and those sorts of things. Um, even in the oil and gas industry, uh, in terms of using sensors to really optimize their operation, manufacturing is kind of mixed. Um, there's some that are using a lot of uh, sensors and technology and, and others that are further behind. Um, same thing with the federal government. Um, some areas of the federal government are really uh, far ahead and doing interesting R&D projects, and then others are lagging behind. I think it's a mix. I don't know any other industries. No, that's well yeah. said. Interesting. So now define uh, what is the ideal reader of this book? Like if, if you say the picture perfect reader, who would that be? Well, for me, I think it's a couple. One is, of course, senior leaders. Hopefully this gives them the inspiration or at least the fear uh, that something's changing and they, and they need to think about it a little bit. I think those who are maybe broadly called middle managers, people who are line managers, either because they aspire to grow their leadership acumen or because they just want to be um, better at how they think and, and work in the role. Certainly there's a lot to offer in the book for them. Um, and then I think if you're an individual contributor, you would want to understand the future technology landscape and how you fit into that if you're um, even at an individual level. And you know, I think there's something in there for everyone. I agree with that. Better to be part of the change than to have it happen to you. Right, ex ex exactly. I think that's that's pretty pretty cool. So um, now let's talk about mathematical organization. So what's next? What is next for uh, in, in in that book for a? So what's what's next in that the mathematical organization uh, book? It's really interesting. Um, even since we've gone uh, to print, we had a bunch of leaders kind of approach us with their stories. They weren't quite ready to share their stories. Um, previously, but they're at a point now where they've made enough progress they're willing to share. So Josh and I are actually collecting additional stories and case studies, and uh, we'll figure out the best way to kind of put those out there. But we just see more and more leaders um, experiencing breakthroughs and wanting to share what they've learned so that others can uh, benefit from it. Yeah, you know, a, a theme I think we're hearing a lot is that people are the drivers of the breakthroughs. The AI models, ensembling a bunch of machine learning models, you know, um, using the machine intelligence kind of technology is just a means to an end. It, it's a way to get work done, and it's a way to learn and to understand what's happened to make some amount of prediction. But always it's been a person who said, what if we do this? What if we have this you know, set of machine learning algorithms, um, we apply them in this space for this reason, and they remove themselves from their constraints to how they normally thought, it's always a person who's the driver of a breakthrough. I think that's really interesting, kind of what's next for you know, the for mathematical corporation. It, people got to remember that we should be the drivers of breakthroughs. We should be using these technologies to help us make it real. There's a good framework in the book that's helpful for people to think through what machines are good at and what people are good at. So, you know, things like organizing and recognizing patterns memory, you know, that's, that's the machine's domain, and then people are great at the creativity, imagination, framing up problems, and setting strategy and vision, like Josh talked about. Interesting. So I think I, I, I recall from, from sort of when, when I, I wrote my second book, I think in both the book scenarios, I, there was an aha moment. So there was a moment where I said, ah, it's all, it's all worth it, or this is amazing. What is that, what was that moment for you guys when when you were writing um, the mathematical organization uh, for me it was the either the hearing the desperation or the raw excitement of people mm -hmm. who decided to start on this journey um and it you know it was, there's a lot of stories in there a lot of mixed uh, results initially um but just the aha of how many people are actually trying this and how they're grappling in the dark and kind of the, the elation of, um, you know, getting to some kind of milestone for me, that's when it all really came together. Um, all these different dimensions of the technology and how to use it and the repercussions and the leadership. And, and we were kind of talking about all these things, but then when you, when you start to look at it through the lens of all these stories and, and the, and what you've actually learned, you know, the lessons you learned from each one of these stories, it, it sinks in. It's, it's a, incredible. 
for me, it was realizing that most of the leaders that we talked to from the book had no background in machine intelligence and mm. in some cases didn't even have a technology background and were willing to open their minds and learn what they needed to learn in order to you know, make these breakthroughs and, and have successful outcomes. So it's just that willingness to totally reinvent themselves and uh, in some cases, you know, launch entirely new careers for themselves. Well, I think it's, it's well said. So I, I remember I was talking to someone that what would Picasso appreciate would be a, probably a better brush, right? So these capabilities are that that brush and executives are still Picasso. You still have sort of your, your art form that you can create from that brush. So I think rightly, rightly uh, uh, in pointing that out. So now, now let's talk about, um, um, so what's next for, so I think one of the things that, that if, if, we, if we look at what Tesla did, so Tesla, they open source their battery patents, right? They say, okay, just anyone, because they want to create awareness uh, as soon as possible. So, so at least, the lobbying would happen and the market became more friendly towards this idea of battery powered cars during that time. And many of the time businesses do those strategies in being data driven or being machine machine learned organization. What are some of like, what are some of the things that, cause I know like companies like you, yours, you guys can do a phenomenal job because you have treasure trove of uh, insights from the leadership point of view, whether it's a, small to mid, mid to large and, 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 and large and beyond. So what are some of your thoughts that l people could do? Like I'm, I'm going in line with lean in uh, or, or, or some of those sort of, uh, some of those uh, campaigns in which people can actually, cause I think you, you, you have a, a fabulous opportunity uh, if, if I would say uh, to sort of create awareness. And I think this book is amazing. I think that's why I, I, was, I, was, I was blown away with the fact that um, that you guys are writing it because it's, I know, like we talk to a lot of people who are on the fence who don't know who to talk to. There's no community element. And, and, and Angela, you said that you'll probably publish a bunch of more stories of executives and, and, and add it to the mix of other stories that probably will happen in the book. So what are some of, some of, some of your thoughts that how would you sort of energize that community to use or uh, being data driven, uh, sort of using, using your current sort of. Uh, corporate background and and sort of your exposure of all these businesses doing fun stuff. You know, one of the uh, one of the themes that I think saw from from doing the book and that you probably that you may recall seeing this terminology all throughout was the idea of embracing complexity as an asset. Um, mm. That's something I think energized a lot of leaders when they realized that instead of doing what most leaders do, and they tr which is try to simplify the problem, um, attack it from one specific angle, there's sort of, um, and in the army, the, the case that um, Andrew talked about earlier, the, the army example, was a, a case where we had a leader who embraced the complexity of what he had, of the real world. And said, "I'm going to use this technology, and I'm going to have an approach that says that complexity is actually an asset. I don't have to re-engineer an entire system. I'm just going to use this technology to connect all of these pieces and embrace the complexity and use it as an asset, so I can get something done faster um, and do it in a more resilient way. Actually, great strategy, great approach. And I'm and so we, I've seen a number of leaders who've kind of been energized by the fact that okay, I don't have to continue to um, use reduction and simplify." I can actually embrace the complexity of my business and how my business works. And instead of trying to re-change everything to fit the technology, I'm just going to have the technology fit the way I actually work, and I'm going to start there. And, you know, what a breath of fresh air for a lot of leaders. Interesting, interesting. So, um, and by the way, thank you so much. Uh, we are almost at the tail end of the conversation. I think one question I definitely want, uh, want your answer on, and this is from my personal experience too. So I expect people... So to read this book and get something out of this, right? And, and many times people come back, they have their own sort of takeaway from the book and definitely it's much appreciated, whatever I, I thought. But as a closing thought, what would that, what would one takeaway you want a, a reader to get from reading this book? That, that you, that's like, they, they have done it. Like, this is amazing. So for me, I would like people to not only think differently, but act differently. This is not a book for people who are happy with the status quo, who love everything they're doing the way it is now. I mean, this is a book for people who really want to make a big change or come up with something 
totally new and innovative. And so the thinking differently involves shattering your constraints, asking bigger questions, and inspiring people. The acting differently involves bringing together diverse teams, people with different backgrounds to spur creativity. It involves the experimentation, the experimentation type approach um, and allowing those failures along the way. Um, but in the end, it's all about, you know, doing something different. That's awesome. I would say um, have the courage to try. You don't have to be an expert in any of these fields. You don't have to understand all of this. Everyone starts at the beginning um, and just have the courage to try. It's not, you don't have to eat the whole elephant in a day, and, but you need to get started. And you have the courage to uh, talk about this in your organization and try. Beautiful. And, and, and again, um, Angela and Josh, uh, thank you so, so much for being super generous with, uh, with your time and sharing with us um, your journey on the mathematical organization. I wish you guys all luck with, with, with the book. I would urge our uh, viewers and listeners to order the book, uh, read the book as well, because I think, again, very few times you would get an opportunity where people who are actually dealing with a lot of businesses with real problem at, at various industry levels write some good things. This is one of those opportunity. And I think definitely um, uh, Josh and Angela, uh, love to have you guys later on our on our podcast discussing the success of the book and probably the, the 2.0 of, uh, I'm always amazed with the sequel of what comes next. And I think, uh, wish you all luck on that. Thanks for having us. And thanks. thanks for everything you're doing. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Uh, I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it And I go into the booth feeling nervous Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless Is the mic gone? I don't know how to work this Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on a certain